All right, we're going to continue in our series here, uh, World Religions and Cults, and we've been uh, covering the Catholic Church. We're getting down the last couple weeks, few weeks here, and we'll see how far we make it tonight. And um, as we continue on key beliefs versus the Bible, key beliefs versus the Bible, and we've been uh, looking at the uh, sacraments uh, of the Catholic Church and examining them according to the Scripture. And tonight, the next uh, sacrament. Now, sacrament is, is what is uh, viewed as a means of God's grace, a means of divine grace. And, uh, and, and so it's not that, I mean, I, I believe in God's grace. Uh, I believe that God does give grace. But uh, this is something that goes beyond just simply believing in God's grace. That we're saved by, we are saved by grace. But they believe that the sacraments are part of that saving grace of God on that journey of, uh, to salvation, that journey to heaven. And uh, there's different kinds of sacraments. There's the three initiation type of sacraments that initiate you into the body of Christ and, and are part of your salvation and regeneration. But um, uh, such as uh, baptism, the Eucharist, which would be communion or the Lord's Supper, and then um, and confirmation. And so confirmation, you go through the classes and you learn the catechism and then you get confirmed. And uh, so those things initiate you into as part of the church uh, and are part of your salvation because, and, and the Catholic Church believes that salvation is through the church. And the reason it's through their church is because the church has the authority over the sacraments and, and bestows the sacraments on the person. So therefore, you need to go through the church to get the sacraments, and that's why the church is the door of salvation. And I think in some ways the modern-day pope has, uh, the current pope has maybe softened up on, you know, like they, they use terms like, well, everybody's God's, you know, all of God's children. And so in certain cases you might have those that open the door to perhaps other people make it as well. Um, but uh, as far as official Catholic doctrine, uh, it's, it's through the sacraments, and the church is the one that is, uh, that gives the, that bestows the sacraments, and, uh, and therefore you need to go through the church. As a matter of fact, uh, the fair a few years ago, uh, there was a Catholic church uh, that had a big booth set up there in one of the buildings, and I mean it had a big sign right up there saying that the church is the door to salvation or the door to heaven. <laughs> I mean, they didn't make it any, uh, no bones about that, uh, no hesitation there. Uh, but the next uh, sacrament that we're going to look at here is the one of penance. Penance. Now, penance is different than repentance. Penance is not a Bible word. Uh, repentance is a Bible word. But penance is what a Catholic person does to obtain forgiveness of sins. Uh, it's different from repentance in that repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So repentance does involve a change, and it does involve some, something on your part as far as um, a change in your life and a change in your thinking. But, forgive, we, but we still cannot earn forgiveness. Repentance does not earn you forgiveness. Uh, but repentance is what changes our mind about our sin and about God. We turn to God. We turn from our sin uh, and then when it comes to, there's different types of repentance. There's repentance for salvation. Uh, that is the initial changing your mind about your sin, realizing you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Changing your mind about God. So repent, Paul preached repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you change your mind about God and your sin, then that should lead us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because then when you repent, when a person repents of their sin, they're agreeing with God about their sin, whereas a lost person, the average lost person, is not thinking about that. They're just going on in their sinful life. They're not concerned about what God thinks about their sin. They're not even sure, that, you know, they may not even refer to it as sin. They may not think of it as sin. But repentance then would be agreeing with God, a change of mind about God and about their sin, agreeing with God that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. And then that leads to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so salvation is not earned, but then there's also repentance that goes on in the Christian life. 
that we're not repenting again towards to, to God for salvation, but if we're already saved, there still should be a change of mind, something happening in our lives, a change of mind that results in a change of action. And as our minds are renewed by the Word of God, as we walk with God and He shows us and the Holy Spirit leads us, uh, in, in, guides us into all truth, the truth of God's Word, then there should be an ongoing change in our own life. Or if we get off into some fleshly things and then we realize, oh my goodness, what am I doing? That's not of God. That's not pleasing to God. It's a change of mind and then we need to get back to what is right. And so that's a good kind of repentance in the Christian life. Uh, the Bible also speaks of a godly sorrow that, that um, uh, works repentance. So that's a good kind of sorrow. But then there's also the sorrow of the world. Uh, there was the sorrow, uh, uh, there was the repentance of Judas. Uh, Judas repented, but he didn't have repentance toward God. He went back to those people that gave him the 30 pieces of silver, and he didn't have true repentance toward God. And so there is a type of change of mind. There's that regret, but it's more of a regret of, of, for other reasons other than I've offended God. Uh, there's, there's a different uh, worldly kind of regret. Somebody might have, uh, somebody might, re uh, let's just say Judas was more of a self-condemning type of uh, uh, regret and repentance, uh, which then led him to take his own life. And that means he did not seek God's forgiveness. He was, he was putting himself in the place as the ultimate judge. And, and uh, he, he uh, just went through the, the coins back there at the uh, priest there and um, uh, the Sanhedrin and the chief priests and uh, the ones who had given him the 30 pieces of silver but he didn't actually go get right with God. He just went out and he hanged himself. And because he was repenting toward them, he was, he was saying, I've betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, ah, what is that to us? Oh, we don't care. And so he was looking to them instead of looking to God. And uh, so that was the worldly kind of uh, sorrow. The sorrow of the world worketh death, the Bible says. So there's different kinds of repentance, different kinds of sorrow. Uh, somebody can be sorry they got caught. <laughs> they're not sorry until they get caught. They do something wrong, they sin, and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm sorry. But they're not really sorry for doing wrong. They're just sorry for the consequences of what their choices were. And that's not a godly sorrow either. But that's repentance. But penance starts with confession to a priest, uh, but also includes other works such as fasting, prayer, reconciliation, tears, prayers, or reading scripture. So, yeah, we believe in reading scripture, we believe in praying, we believe in you know, fasting and prayer, all those things. But those things don't earn you forgiveness. Those are things that can help you getting back into close fellowship with God and, and restoring a good fellowship with God. But repent, uh, forgiveness is not earned. Uh, there was a, um, a number of years ago, uh, there was a, a crime drama on television and one of the main characters uh, is, is uh, portrayed to be Catholic. Now, they don't inject a lot of things spiritually about that uh, religiously into the program, but on one particular program, uh, he starts out by going to a priest. And he had a history in another city, and this priest was from another city. And, um, and he, so, he, uh, so he went to see that particular priest or the archbishop or some high-ranking Catholic official from that other city where he was from, and he had some past, some history of something that he did there in the line of duty uh, as a police officer. And um, one of the things that they, uh, that he's, he's, he's just continually struggling over this, over this, he's come back to this many, many times, he's confessed it, and yet he still can't get this heaviness off of his heart about whatever happened, which may not have been, uh, you know, it, it, may not have been a, a, a sin, so to speak, but he had blood on his hands as far as, uh, ta I think, um, probably taking a life of some sort that in the line of duty, which may have been justified as the story goes. But, but anyway, the thing that sticks out is that, uh, you know, the priest said, well, you'll know. When you've done enough, you'll know. You'll know. And uh, basically, he struggled with it. He's confessed it. He's confessed it. But he just couldn't get that uh, forgiveness. He just couldn't get past this guilt and the shame of, of, of what had happened in that other place. And, and, uh, and that, that's part of, that's, that's a, an integration. It was not a Christian television show. Uh, it wasn't even a religious, religious based or uh, oriented television show, but the main character was uh, portrayed to be Catholic. And uh, when you 
You know, when you've done enough, you'll know that is the doctrine of penance. That is, you, you have to do some things to atone for your sin, to gain forgiveness. And then finally, you're cleared of this guilt or this fault in your life. But that is not, uh, that's not the way God presents it in Scripture. Um, this is where the Catholic, uh, in the er old, older days of the Catholic Church, uh, the priests would sell indulgences. And so penance, indulgences were connected to penance. And uh, because, hey, if indulgences were things that you could purchase, uh, you'd give them money and then they would give you these indulgences and those would help purchase your forgiveness. You could earn forgiveness. And so that was what Martin Luther uh, protested against primarily. Martin Luther didn't really deviate a whole lot from Catholic doctrine. I mean, there were certain areas. He certainly didn't go along with the authority of Rome. He, he objected to the authority of the Pope in certain ways, but he especially had a problem with indulgences and the way that that was done in the priests taking advantage of people and the corruption in the priesthood. There were other, many other doctrines that he didn't uh, differ from the Catholic Church on. So a lot of the 95 Theses were related to the indulgences. And so... Uh, um, so from a biblical standpoint, I, don't, I didn't find, I read through the 95 Theses and I didn't find them all that inspiring. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the things that he's speaking against, there's some good things he's speaking against, but he wasn't, this wasn't some great theological document. <laughs> um, but, but that was his primary protest against Rome. But at the Catholic Church now, um, they believe that the church has a treasury of spiritual goods that can be tapped into, including Christ's merits, the prayers of Mary, and the good works of saints. So these indulgences are partaking of uh, what Christ has done, the prayers of Mary, the good works of the saints, that all those things can help you in getting past this guilt that you have. And uh, what they would do, the powers that be at the time, at the time of Martin Luther, uh, were using it to line their own pockets and take advantage of the people. They were trying to get money out of people. Hey, if you can just tell people, hey, to get forgiveness, you've got to have these indulgences, but yeah, you can pay for, you can buy these indulgences and get forgiveness. I mean, that's a good way, that's a pretty good money racket right there, a pretty good racket, taking advantage of people. But the doctrine is contradictory, because while they say that Christ, they, they, the doctrine is, says that Christ's merits have infinite value, infinite value. But yet they also include Mary's prayers and prayers of the saints. So part of that penance, uh, part of those indulgences are, are Mary's prayers and prayers of the saints. Well then apparently Christ's merits uh, don't have infinite value because if Christ's merits had infinite value, you wouldn't need the prayers of the saints and the prayers of Mary. And 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 uh, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Let's turn to that scripture. Um, First uh, John, because I'll actually read another verse of that, uh, not just verse 9, but First John, back in the back of your Bible. First uh, John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, don't, don't forget that, um, that Catholic penance involves confession to a priest. But that does not necessarily guarantee your forgiveness that the priest, because you, you may need to do more. You may need to do more. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So notice, that's it. You, you confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It comes from agreeing with God about our sins, confessing it to him, and, uh, and then he's faithful and just. He fit, forgives us and he cleanses us. And then uh, look at verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. So the purpose of 1 John is uh, twofold, really, the main, main themes of 1 John. One is... Uh, how you can know for sure that you have eternal life. What is the evidence of salvation? How do you know you're saved for sure? And number two is how can you remain and have good fellowship with God? 
And so here he says, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. So that's part of the fellowship with God. And um, that as, as we grow in fellowship with God, we're not going to be going off into sin and, and living sinful lives. But he says, if, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So who is our advocate? It's not the prayers of Mary. Uh, it's not the prayers of the saints. It is Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the advocate. He's the one who goes before the Father on our behalf uh, to plead our case, and it's through his shed blood. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so Jesus, by his death on the cross, uh, his shed blood was sufficient to be the propitiation. Now, propitiation is a big word. But was what it means is that not only did he pay for our sins, not only did he shed his blood for us, not only uh, on our behalf, but it's, it's on our behalf in order to appease the wrath of God. So the wrath of God abides on the lost people, and that's every human being at some point in their lives. <laughs> uh, even if a person saved it, you know, six, seven years old, well... When they, before they got saved and they were at a point of accountability to God, the, the wrath of God, you know, if a person saved at 10 years old, well, they, if they're of an age of accountability and being able to understand sin and God and, and the gospel, um, or if someone's 50 years old and they get saved at 50, um, for their life up to that point, they were living under the wrath of God. So everybody at some point lived under the wrath of God. And so Jesus is that propitiation. He's the go-between. So not only did he pay for our sins, his, his payment was enough for God to pull back his hand of judgment and wrath upon those who have Christ's blood applied to their lives. And that's the significant, you know, tonight is uh, the start of Passover. And so Christ, the Passover lamb, he was sacrificed for us. And, um, you know, those who are observant Jews but not necessarily believing Jews in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, they recognize uh, what God did for them in Egypt. But we also recognize, in addition to the great thing God did in Egypt, the work of deliverance and bringing them out of bondage, we recognize that the Messiah has come and he, all those years ago, at this time of year, uh, shed his blood to be the propitiation. So what it means is... Uh, let's let's let me use an example. If uh, you know, let's say I'm I'm gonna I've got to discipline Joanna, and uh, my wrath is abiding on her. Now don't don't misunderstand me. There, there's not supposed to be anger and wrath in the home. Just I'm using the word about <laughs> that applies to God and His wrath on the lost world. But let's say my wrath is going to come down on Joanna because she did wrong. She sinned. But then all of a sudden, Lydia goes between and she does something that then causes me to say, all right, my wrath will not come down on Joanna. And that's what Jesus did, was that he took our place and he shed his blood in order to appease the wrath of God, that God's wrath could be appeased. Okay, the price has already been paid, the pay, uh, payment's already been made, the penalty's already been paid, and so therefore the wrath of God does not have to come upon the world. But particularly, it does not come upon believers. And um, unfortunately, though, for the lost and dying world, Christ has paid the penalty but at the same time, if they do not receive that gift of salvation, they do not receive what he did on the cross and the shed blood applied to their life, they still abide under the wrath of God and they still stand condemned because of their sin. So it's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is how one is saved and has the blood of Christ applied to the life and does not have to face the wrath of God. But that's different than what the Catholic Church teaches. You know, you need to earn forgiveness. You need to do enough. And really, even in the end, can you ever be sure that you've done enough? Now, I don't have a Catholic background, but my understanding, you know, if you talk to a Catholic person, if, if you ask them, you know, do they really know for sure that they're saved and have eternal life? My, my understanding is, you know, a lot of them, they're, they're not taught that they can know for sure. It's just, well, you've got to do enough. You've got to have... You got to go to purgatory, or you have to have, have the indulgences, or confess enough, and and it's it's a it's a life of just continually spinning your wheels and doing more and more 
uh, to try to gain God's favor and forgiveness. And that is not what the Bible teaches. And so that is the sacrament of penance. There's another sacrament uh, uh, that is anointing the sick. Anointing the sick. And that is known, formerly known as extreme unction, but they call it anointing the sick. Now, in the uh, churches, uh, the Catholic Church's sacrament of anointing the sick through the ministry of the priest, it is Jesus who touches the sick to heal them from sin and sometimes even from physical ailment. So it's through the ministry of the priest, but it has to do, once again, with divine grace being bestowed and the healing from sin, forgiveness of sin. Uh, his cures, what they teach, his cures were signs of the arrival of the kingdom of God. The core message of his healing tells us of his plan to conquer sin and death by his dying and rising. The rite of anointing tells us there is no need to wait until a person is at the point of death to receive the sacrament. A careful a judgment about the serious nature of the illness is sufficient. So the way that they look at it is, this is different than physical healing of, of um, what the Bible teaches. Uh, you can, you know, the, uh, that you can pray for God's healing physically, um, and, and, and God does, according to his will, will we'll hear an answer, and, and he does at times heal. Earthly speaking, he'll give his children eternal healing. Uh, even in heaven, if he takes them to home, home to be with him. But in this case, the rite of anointing, the anointing the sick, is generally at the end of life when they're about ready to die. And that's, once again, another thing that is meant to take care of their sins. But then they say, well, if, if, the, if, the, if the priest makes a judgment call that the, nature, that the, the illness is that serious, that it's probably really serious uh, enough for them to die soon, uh, then um, even if it's not at the point of death, even if it's a little before death, uh, then that will be sufficient. When the sacrament of anointing the sick is given, the hoped-for effect is that if it be God's will, the person be physically healed of illness, which doesn't really make sense because it's meant to be at the point of death. That's primarily when it's done, the last rites. Um, but even if there is no physical healing, the primary effect of the sacrament is a spiritual healing by which the sick person receives the Holy Spirit's gift of peace and courage to deal with the difficulties that accompany serious illness or the frailty of old age. Now, once again, we believe in God's grace, but this is not part of gaining forgiveness of sins uh, by, through the ministry of the priest. Uh, and I'll turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven... And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. You know, in, in this life, uh, getting physical healing of sickness or the infirmities is not a guarantee in this life because most of what God is concerned about in this life is for us to bring glory to Him. And what brings Him most glory at times? It is when His grace is sufficient for us even through the infirmity. He doesn't just guarantee that he's going to heal it, which at times he does, and that brings him glory. But Paul besought the Lord, he sought the Lord three times 
And he said, oh, I, he said, and Paul said, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'd rather have Christ's power, God's grace upon me, than to be healed if that is what God's will is. I was thinking about um, recently, uh, Brother uh, Brian Sharp of the Gentile Ministry, he took a trip to Israel with a few men, and it was not the regular tourist trip to Israel. It was another trip that they do that takes them a little deeper into things and, and more, uh, uh, not just as, not regular tourist stuff. And, uh, and I wondered, wow, he went on this trip, and he's been dealing with this terrible, terrible shoulder and chest pain and, and neck pain. And I thought, well, I guess he must have been feeling well enough to uh, go on that. And yet he uh, talked about in his reports uh, that uh, most of the time his pain was at a 10 and they got to the point where he would need to lie down on a bench to get some relief. And yet he was still plugging, he was still going forward, plugging away there in Israel on this trip. And I thought, wow, what a testament uh, to the grace of God that uh, j when I feel like I'm, <laughs> you know, when I feel like my neck's bother me, which it has been these last uh, number of weeks as far as um, can tell it's just out of whack, which, which messes me up in other ways, uh, I thought, boy, that doesn't hold a candle to having a 10 pain level. And I thought, when I'm tempted to think about, oh, boy, I just can't think straight, I can't focus straight, and it's just what's... And yet I think about, boy, he's walking around Israel uh, with a level 10 pain and getting nauseated because of the pain, and he's got to lie down because of the pain. And, and that was a testament that he was even able to do that trip, a testament of the grace of God being sufficient. And that's an example, a human example, Paul, a human example of God's grace being sufficient. There's times God sees fit to either give us healing directly or he gives us an answer of how we can get some help and healing. But uh, God's grace is sufficient through our infirmities. Uh, turn to James chapter 5, James chapter 5 and verse 13. And this is important as it relates to the uh, doctrine of extreme unction. So I'm going to read this passage, and I'm going to read to you then, and we're going to finish with this, uh, this particular sacrament. Uh, but what a commentator said about this, and he, he makes a reference to the uh, sacrament of extreme unction. And uh, James 5, verse 13 is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now this, sir, this cannot be the sacrament of extreme unction the way the Catholics teach it, simply because uh, there it speaks of anointing with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And with the last rites that are done, uh, certainly that person is not raised up and healed uh, when the priest initiates the last rites. And this is a difficult passage in some of the word, in some of the phrases here, and uh, because of they say, well, when you look at things through a human lens and the experience, they say, well, I don't know if I see that happening all the time. What does that actually mean if he have committed sins? they shall be forgiven him. And what does it mean, the prayer of faith shall save the sick? I'm sure there are many who have prayed and they've had faith, but they didn't necessarily uh, uh, get uh, saved from uh, in their sickness. But Albert Barnes, uh, I'm just going to read as quickly as I can. Here's, there's a pretty good portion here, but we'll, uh, I, I liked what he had to say about it. Uh, he said, this passage is important not only for the counsel which it gives of the sick, but because it has been employed by the Roman Catholic communion as almost the only portion of the Bible referred to to sustain one of the particular rites of their religion, that of extreme unction, a sacrament as they suppose to be administered to those who are dying. It is of importance, therefore, to inquire more particularly into its meaning. There can be but three views taken of the passage. One, that it refers to a miraculous healing by the apostles or by other early ministers of religion who were endowed with the power of healing diseases in this manner. And he says, to me, this, uh, to this view, the objections seem to me be, uh, be insuperable. Nothing of this kind is said by the apostle. Uh, so he's, and just I'm going to uh, kind of summarize, he doesn't subscribe to that. Um, it is supposed, number two, it is supposed by the Roman Catholics to give sanction to the practice of extreme unction and to prove that this was practiced in the primitive church. But the objections to this are still more obvious 
A, here in this scripture, it was not to be performed at death or in the immediate prospect of death, but in sickness at any time. There is no hint that it was to be only when the patient was past all hope of recovery or in view of the fact that he was to die, but extreme unction from its very nature is to be practiced only where the patient is past all hope of recovery. Um, it was not with a view to his death, but to his living that it was to be practiced at all. It was not that he might be prepared to die, but that he might be restored to health, because it says in the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. But extreme unction can be with no such reference and no such hope. It is only with the expectation that the patient is about to die. And if there were any expectation that he would be raised up even by this ordinance, it could not be administered as extreme unction. Uh, he says, the ordinance practiced as extreme unction is a right wholly unauthorized in the scriptures unless it be by this passage. Um, the remaining supposition, therefore, and as it seems to me the true one, is that the anointing with oil was, and this is once again his viewpoint, in accordance with a common custom regarded as medicinal, and that a blessing was to be invoked on this as a means of restoration to health. Besides what has been already said, the following suggestions may be made in addition. This was, as we have seen, a common usage in the East and is to this day. This interpretation meets all that is demanded to a fair understanding of what is said by the Apostle. Everything thus directed is rational and proper. Uh, and so that was what, those were those, his three, but what I wanted to especially focus on was why he said it could not be extreme unction of the Catholic Church. Now, I have per personally practiced, seen this practice of anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. What does it say? Let him call for the elders of the church. And I tend to disagree with Albert Barnes that it was medicinal uh, simply because it's something that's connected with spiritual. It is not just simply blessing the medicine. Uh, it was something very specific that a person comes to the place where they come to the very end of themselves. Like, I have, I have nowhere left to turn. I've, we've prayed about it. Uh, we've sought medical help about it. And yet it seems like there is no hope. It doesn't mean the person's about to die. It may not be a sickness unto death. Uh, but what it means is, is just this is something very special, very unique, very serious. And what does it say? Let him call for the elders of the church. And that's, that's the key right there. Now, there are some who deal with anointing with oil as a very casual thing, like somebody's just going around and let's, let's go to this country or that place and let's just go through anointing people with oil. And, you know, that's, that's not what this passage is teaching. It says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And what is that? That is simply a person comes to the end of themselves because it takes great humility to ask for that kind of help and that kind of thing to be done. But we have seen directly God answer that prayer through the anointing of oil and praying when a person has truly, humbly asked for that to be done. Um, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they should be forgiven him. And it's interesting, there's that connection with sins, which means that don't, this isn't just something medicinal here, uh, but there's a spiritual element of, of maybe a, um, some sort of stronghold in the person's life, or uh, some sort of, maybe it's a satanic attack, or whatever it might be. But it takes great humility to ask for that kind of a, of, of a thing to be done. And I'll just say, I don't have all the answers to this passage, but I agree with Albert Barnes here uh, that it is not, it does not fit with the sacrament of anointing the sick or extreme unction. That is not, that is not what is in view here. And yes, I, as I said, we've seen this, I've seen this done. As a matter of fact, um, it was a few years ago when Elizabeth was dealing with adrenal fatigue and and it just seemed like, boy, it was, she was not really getting better, getting better, getting better. She made a little bit of progress, but just not really getting over that hump. And it was, she finally, she came to the place where she asked, she said, if she wanted to be anointed with oil and prayed over. Now, we don't have multiple elders of the church here. It's just me. But what we decided to do is we waited until the Danfords were here. And uh, so Brother Danford, who is an ordained minister, uh, he, he was a pastor for a lot of years. Um, he was here and we asked if he would pray over her with, along with me and both of us prayed over her 
And it was at that time, and it was a remarkable answer to prayer that from that point forward, there was a huge change and a huge breakthrough uh, in her health at that point. And uh, it wasn't medicinal oil or anything like that. It was just simply anointing with oil. And because of that region, you know, talk about Israel and, the, uh, and, and where Christ was and everything, they used olive oil, I'm sure. And so we use olive oil and just anoint and then pray over. And, uh, and God answered in that case. And uh, that was done another time, the scene. And, uh, but it's not a casual thing. It's not something... Oh, I have the sniffles. Can you pour some oil on me and pray over me? You know, that type of thing. Is there's the, 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 as I said, I don't have all the answers of this passage of what every exact thing means. But uh, is that I want to say dogmatically. Uh, but it does seem to be when you have that connection with prayer, faith shall save the sick. Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. There's something very special and unique about uh, that type of uh, thing being done, and uh, but it cu it starts with the initiation, uh, initiating the person who is sick. Uh, it's not just going around and hey, I got some oil here. Let me pray over you. <laughs> uh, that's not that's not what that's not what's happening here. But this is not this that that passage may, would be the closest they get to extreme unction, the anointing of the sick. But as far as the sacrament of forgiveness and, and things of that nature. But that's, that's not what's in view here. This has to do with the people being raised up. But the last rites, the, the, the extreme unction, that is when people are about to die. And so that is not backing that particular sacrament. I like what, uh, like what Albert Barnes says. I didn't read this part, but he says... Um, there are instances indeed of persons being embalmed after death. It was a fact also that the Savior said of Mary when she poured ointment on his body that she did it for his burial or with reference to his burial. But the Savior did not say it was in reference to his death or was designed in any way to prepare him to die, nor is there any instance in the Bible in which such a rite is mentioned. The ceremony of extreme unction has its foundation in two things. First, in superstition, in the desire of something that shall operate as a charm or that shall possess physical efficiency in calming the apprehensions of a troubled conscience and in preparing the guilty to die. And second, in the fact that it gives immense power to the priesthood. Nothing is better adapted to impart such power than a prevalent belief that a minister of religion holds in his hands the ability to alleviate the pangs of the dying and to furnish a sure passport to a world of bliss. There is deep philosophy in that which has led to the belief of this doctrine. For the dying look around for consolation and support, and they grasp at anything which will promise ease to a troubled conscience and the hope of heaven. The gospel has made arrangements to meet this state of mind in a better way, in the evidence which the guilty may have that by repentance and faith their sins are blotted out through the blood of the cross. And I like we so love what he says there about that. It is not needing a priest to do something as you're about ready to die, it's through the blood of the cross, uh, you have that peace and you have that hope and you have that forgiveness. And that's where we're going to stop tonight uh, with that sacrament. Um, so we covered those two sacraments tonight of uh, penance and anointing the sick, which has been known historically as extreme unction.